Okay. So I'd like to talk about uh, briefly about the S European Dementia Ethics Network. I'll give you a few definitions of assistive technology and ethics, and then I'll move straight on to talking about the ethical issues linked to the use of assistive technology in residential care, covering the mainly covering tracking and surveillance and recreation and well-being. And then hopefully if there's a little bit of time, a few of the implications of assistive technology specifically for health professional carers. Oops. So the work of the of the assistive technology on assistive technology was carried out in the framework of the European Dementia Ethics Network, which consists of the creation of an internet based ethics platform for the discussion of ethical issues linked to the care of people with dementia, combined with group work on specific issues leading to guidelines on those issues, which in this case is assistive technology. And our current goal is to publish by the end of this year a comprehensive literature review, background information on assistive, on, sorry, on ethics and assistive technology, and guidelines. In order to achieve this, we have a working group on assistive technology, and here you can see the members of this working group who are from a range of different backgrounds. We also have a steering committee, which oversees the work of the working group, as well as determining the structure and organization of the whole project. And last Wednesday, we had a joint meeting of both groups to discuss the recommendations and make final changes to the whole document. So I'll just give you a few definitions now. So assistive technology is the term used to describe devices or systems which allow people to perform tasks which they would otherwise be unable to do or to increase the ease and safety with which tasks can be performed. And some devices or systems may be fairly simple off the shelf and even intended for other purposes, whereas some may be more complicated or expensive and require expert installation. Broadly speaking, ethics is a branch of philosophy which seeks to address issues related to concepts of right and wrong. It is sometimes referred to as moral philosophy and can be broadly divided into the four subject areas. And the area we're interested in is applied ethics, which examines the controversial issues and applies ethical theories to real life situations, in this case, to the use of assistive technology. With regard to ethical principles, these could be described as expressions of agreed values or rules of thumb, which serve to guide people's actions in order to achieve the best possible ethical outcome, thereby encouraging people to consider the broader context and respect other people rather than being solely preoccupied with their own interests. And these are the, ethical, the main ethical principles and related concepts which guided our work. And the, foot, the first four on the left are those outlined by Beauchamp and Childress in their famous textbook on the principles of biomedical ethics. But these are by no means the most important. So practically all forms of assistive technology could be used in residential care settings as well as in the home. So many of the ethical issues will be similar but the situation and living conditions of people with dementia in residential care will be different. And so first of all, I'm going to look at tracking and surveillance devices, and there you have a few examples of the kind of devices that we're talking about. And the, the main ethical issues can be divided into these three categories, and so I'll start with balancing autonomy and safety. So a major issue related to the use of the, tracking, oops, of the tracking and surveillance devices is that of balancing respect for autonomy and freedom of movement with concerns about safety. Tracking and surveillance devices can be seen as contributing towards autonomy by enabling a person to go out alone, which might help maintain morale, self-esteem and social contacts, provide exercise and generally improve quality of life. Those which monitor movement may enable people to get along with certain aspects of their daily lives in relative privacy, but with the assurance that staff will be alerted if and when needed. And then on the other hand, the same devices may be seen as a means of restriction with an overemphasis on safety. 
a form of coercion or social control, and this may lead to frustration and increased dependency on others. Looking at closer to some of these issues, with regard to risk, it's not realistic or probably even desirable to rule out every possible risk. And if you did, you would never go out or do anything. And people all take varying degrees of risk in their daily lives. People's assessment of safety also differs greatly. And there may be differences of opinion between people with dementia, relatives and staff, which is why it's important to include everyone concerned in decisions related to the use of, of tracking devices and, and surveillance devices. But assistive technology can also be a useful means to ensure that residents have the freedom of movement they are entitled to and the safety they need. However, due to staff shortages or cuts, assistive technology may be being used in some cases solely to keep people in a confined space or even in their seats against their will. And this would not only be unethical, but also illegal. And in Austria, for example, the use of electronic devices to confine people to a limited area without their consent is legally recognised as unlawful restraint. But residents need to have access to appropriate assistive technology when it would most benefit them, which is not necessarily linked to a particular stage of dementia or age, will not be the same for everyone and could therefore be difficult to achieve but in any case, anyone using such technology should have consented to it or their legal guardians in some cases. The issues of personhood and devaluation or status loss are closely linked to stigma. And according to Lincoln Fellon, stigma is a complex social phenomenon, which we heard about earlier today, which occurs when the components that you see on this slide converge. And of course, this is just one conceptualization. In residential care settings, the use of tracking and tagging devices may contribute to all of these factors. The use of a device, particularly if known about or obtrusive, may lead to labeling or additional labeling on top of the label of dementia. Stereotypes may be attached to people using such devices, which may contribute towards them being considered as other in the sense of not like us. And this may lead to a loss of status, devaluation and discrimination, such as social distancing, as well as various emotional reactions. This may also be accompanied by perceived differences in power between residents and staff, or between users and non-users of the various devices. However, what I have described is just one possibility, and to some extent, or hopefully, a worst case scenario, largely dependent on the meanings that people attribute to such devices. The actual degree of freedom and observation might not actually be so much the problem as to how it is interpreted. Perhaps the person considers this an injustice or a withdrawal of privileges or discrimination, and this may make him or her feel devalued or in some way a lesser person. Other people might just find the devices useful and see them in the context of offering more freedom the visual aspects of the devices and how other people react to their use may also affect how they are perceived. So basically, the devices themselves would not be stigmatizing, but the meanings that people attach to them may make them so. So ethical discussions could therefore focus on finding out about the meanings that people attach to these devices, how people feel about using them, whether they could be made less visible, how staff perceive their use and react to, this, to the various alarms, as users and other residents may pick up on this, and also how people using such devices are perceived and treated by others. Oops. Moving on to a few other relevant issues. The, the measure should be appro appropriate to the need, or as James McKillop said in our last meeting, we should not be taking a sledgehammer to crack a nut and alternatives to the use of assistive technology should also be considered. Care must be taken to avoid drawing attention, unnecessary attention to difficult problems, for example, monitors for incontinence or to detect people getting out of bed in the middle of the night, could draw the attention of other residents to a person's problem and result in feelings of shame. So also if various devices are too obtrusive, people may feel infantilized. 
so discretion and sensitivity is needed. Filming people or keeping track of their movements is an invasion of privacy to which the person with dementia may or may not have personally consented. And there are nevertheless certain areas where video monitoring would be inappropriate. There may be cultural issues linked to how, pe how, to how people from some ethnic groups wish to be seen in public. And in residential care, the distinction between the private and the public domain may be somewhat blurred. Concerning confidentiality, ethical issues arise as to how the information about a person's actions or whereabouts should be stored, if indeed it should be stored at all, and, and also for how long. And also, who should have access to live or, live or stored recordings? So this is also linked to the issue of consent and hence respect for a person's autonomy as well as privacy. This slide shows a few examples of assistive technology used for recreation, interaction and well-being. Quality of life is a relevant concern for every aspect of care and with regard to practically all ethical principles. Various devices can provide a safe environment in which to interact socially, in some cases can facilitate interaction between the generations and bring leisure activities and entertainment to people who cannot always get out. And in some cases, this can be literally brought to the, a care home, for example, by means of a specially equipped bus. But this must, be respect, this must be balanced with respect for people's autonomy and their right to privacy. And clearly, some people may not wish to take part, and so they should not be placed under any pressure. Or, and also, there may be people who are worried about using computers and, in, and appearing incompetent. And a few concerns have been expressed about the use of companion robots for people with dementia, such as becoming attached to them, not wanting to share them, the device is breaking down, or the person moving away. Some companion robots have the built-in capacity to respond to touch, to establish eye contact, and to demand attention and nurturing behavior. And for some people with dementia who have difficulties communicating and feel isolated, this may be an opportunity to feel wanted and to give. The fact that the subject of interaction is inanimate is perhaps not the most important issue, and the object may also provide an opportunity for other care staff, for the people to interact verbally and non-verbally with the person with dementia. However, concerns about dignity have been expressed, mainly by relatives and friends. For example, that socially assistive robots and perhaps certain devices for leisure activities are in some way demeaning and undignified, even though the person with dementia may be getting a lot out of these devices. The image of the person interacting with the object perhaps, cl perhaps clashes with carers' memories of that person's former character, and consequently it's disturbing for them, but not necessarily to the person with dementia. Most of the issues discussed so far have direct implications for, for staff in residential care settings, but more specifically, video surveillance may also infringe on their privacy rights. They may, may need areas where they can relax off camera, but it's unlikely that their consent would have been sought. It has been argued that they could seek employment elsewhere, but this might not be practical. And it has also been argued that continuing to work under such circumstances amounts to implicit consent, but this is clearly debatable. One might also ask how staff feel about the impact of monitoring on their relationship and the personal bonds that they form with the residents. Staff may have concerns about litigation linked to false accusations of negligence or abuse based on video monitoring, or, as mentioned earlier, on failure to protect residents from harm whilst at the same time not illegally restricting their freedom of movement. So these issues need to be discussed by all concerned, and the working group established, uh, sorry, recommended establishing ethical protocols on the use of assistive technology to be signed by all those accepting responsibility. Staff should also be trained in the appropriate use, choice, use, and review of assistive technology. And as they have to deal with various ethical dilemmas, also be trained in how to handle ethical, ethical problems. Finally, staff are faced with the task of caring for a whole group of people, allocating time and attention to all, and balancing the needs and rights of all residents. 
this may result in ethical dilemmas, and so this can be a very difficult area for them to handle. And so this is, again, why we need training. Assistive technology, on the other hand, may result in time savings for professional carers, which hopefully would not result in staff cuts or less time spent with residents, but rather to provide an, an opportunity to dedicate more time to meaningful interaction and enjoyable activities with residents. And here's a picture of a few people doing just that. Thank you for your attention.